really long time, uh, long enough to write a book about cosmic culture, because I feel like once you've been in a uh, industry for 20 years, you see enough that you have, you know, a good um, understanding of how it became what it is. So uh, I wrote this book for a publisher called Sterling Inc. in um, 19, no, 2019, and. Um, uh, it came out, it was supposed to definitely come out April of 2020, and so, uh, of course, the release got pushed back because of the pen panini, <laughs> and uh, so it ended up coming out in August of 2020. So, um, for me, this book was really like a pinnacle of like my career, or at least that's how I viewed it when I wrote it. And um, it has been definitely a, a, a big disappointment to not, to not be able to release it in person and to meet people and um, share the book with them in person, have uh, discussions and you know answer questions. And also like, I have tons of questions for people who have read the book. So now that we have conventions again, I uh, definitely wanted to do a panel about the book to sort of like introduce um, people to the book because it, it truly has so much information in there that defines not only me but also cosplay. So I feel like all of these years that I've been doing convention panels on various subjects of cosplay and answering Q&A questions, so much of it I've packed into this book. So I'm like, I'll introduce you to the book and then um, tell you about the process of um, how I wrote it. So yeah, I <laughs> intro why book. So yeah, like I, I've been cosplaying for a really long time, um, since 1999. And so like the I have so many stories and I have just so many thoughts about this world of cosplay we live in. And um, I really have always wanted to put it in some kind of a writing form. And so I, um, let's see, oops. And I actually was approached by Sterling in 2017 to write the book. And um, they wanted actually it to be like a crafting book. And I'm like, so many people write crafting books, you know? And like, I can very easily write another crafting book that's a how-to, uh, but what I felt like I wanted to share was um, the history of cosplay and the sociological aspects of cosplay and to talk about things that um, people haven't written about in books. And uh, so I pushed and you know was able to convince them to give me a shot at writing a semi-autobiographical book as well as a cultural book. So that is what this book is about. It's not gonna tell you step by step how to make a costume but it sure as hell will motivate you to get into cosplay. So I'm just gonna do a very quick um, rundown of the chapters. For those of you who've read, read the book, you know you know this. Um, but I just I'm gonna do a rundown real quick to to share like what you could expect if you pick up this book. So it's uh, the. The book, I broke it apart in multiple parts, and then each part has various chapters where I go into depth. So the first one is called Welcome to the World of Cosplay, and um, the chapter one is, you know, very brief overview of what cosplay is, why it's different from Halloween, who I am, uh, what, you know, how, like, cosplay sort of plays in uh, with fandom and video games and, you know, um, uh, comic book movies and stuff. So like, like cosplay is a pretty big deal. So then I go to chapter two and go take you all the way back to my childhood. I was born in China, but then I was raised in Germany and I called it a girl drawing in the corner because for most of my teenage years, that's literally what I did. I was always the girl drawing in the corner. Um, I drew anime and uh, manga characters. <laughs> Or I read a lot of, you know, uh, uh, a lot of fiction books as well as manga and such. And then um, 
I go, I have a chapter that is called Yaya's Advice. So the publisher really wanted me to sprinkle in these chapters called Yaya's Advice, where I do go into some form of like tips and tricks for making costumes. And so for those who've read the book, I know those chapters can be a little bit like, take you out of the flow of the story. That was not my choice. <laughs> I would have been fine putting them like maybe all together like the back of the book, um, but they really wanted it to be, you know, in, in every part of the book. I don't know. So like starting a costume is very basic, you know, uh, giving you advice on how to choose your characters, you know, how to time manage and how you should, you know, um, have expectations on creating a costume if you've never done one before. So then we go back to the meat of the book and I'm really proud of this part, this uh, part two, the history of cosplay. Um, and chapter three is called the boomerang effect because uh, cosplay actually came from the West and it was originated as fandom costuming at Worldcon in 1939 and you know throughout the 50s, 60s, all the way up to the uh, 90s was at um, you know pop culture conventions in the United States. And then it made a jump to um, Japan where it was picked up and the word cosplay was coined. Maybe you guys have heard the story before. Um, but then the, the Japanese community really made cosplay their own culture and they started making costumes really like the, the, based on the um, anime and video game and, and you know, manga characters. And they sort of really elevated this form into um, like a, 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 a mass uh, appeal versus like I think in the US beforehand, fandom costuming was really sort of very, very niche um, and very like only like for adults, for example. And so it was really cool to have cosplay sort of bounce back to the United States um, and to the Western world, but as like the Japanese influence. And that's how I got started. I went to, you know, um, Anime Expo 1999, and uh, that I saw Japanese cosplayers, uh, and I was incredibly inspired by them. Uh, so chapter four is called How Cosplay Saved My Life, and I know it's quite dramatic, title, but it truly is kind of how I felt because I was a very, I was a young adult, had just moved from Germany um, to the United States by myself, and I really didn't know where I wanted to go in my life. And um, if I hadn't discovered cosplay and hadn't gone to the convention, uh, I am not sure like where I would be. I, I think I would have actually moved back to Germany and had a very, very boring, office job, you know, maybe done something with like German to Chinese translation, and that would have been my life. I, uh, but cosplay changed my life completely, and I really felt like it gave me um, a focus when I most needed it, you know. So then I have a chapter called The Fire Fairy that sort of um, chronicles like this experience I had um, at an early convention uh, called Animazement, and I think that was year 2000. And um, my friends and I did this fairy group and it was one of the first times we had ever won Best in Show. So I sort of give you a nostalgic look back at conventions from that era. And chapter six, this was a really hard chapter to write, um, the growing pains of a fringe culture. Um, I've thought about this a lot, about how cosplay really was very misunderstood for very many years and before it became mainstream, how we uh, cosplayers were really viewed as the freaks of the anime world. Um, like people were, you know, like people that collected cool figures and model kits and, you know, DVDs and, you know, laser discs. <laughs> they were the cool people, right? Like, they were like the cool fans or like people that collected the cell art, the actual, you know, um, art from, from anime that cost hundreds if not thousands of dollars. Like, they were the real fans. And then the 
the cosplayers, we were just like the dumb kids running around conventions. And so I, uh, for those that ha that did not cosplay back then, that didn't go like get into the convention culture in the 2000s, this gives you a really good picture of what it was like back then and how like ostracized we felt, but also how freeing it was because no one took us serious. There were no stakes. We, it was like the wild, wild west. We just ran around being kids and we just had fun dressing up as our characters. Um, but then as cosplay you know, started to immerse more with the convention world, it, uh, like, it, it definitely butted heads a lot with the different um, other uh, communities. And so I talk about those growing pains of like what it's like for a small niche French culture to slowly grow. And then we go to another advice chapter where I give um, tips about sewing and armor. I mean, I, I wrote everything and I, those are important information in there that I really do believe in. Um, but it, it is like, I do recommend reading the Yaya's advice chapters, maybe separately from, um, like just, just keep going on the main chapters. So then part three is called the creative expression of cosplay, because now I've given you a rundown of the history of cosplay, where it came to be. And so the creative expression of cosplay is really more looking at the current state, you know, what it means to be a community. So chapter seven in there is all about conventions, all about like my experiences at conventions, what it's like to maybe meet your heroes while wearing a costume, like meet the creator of the, the character that you're cosplaying as, you know, that magic and like just the fact that we're, we're able to do that now. Um, what it's like to enter contests and how cosplay contests developed. And um, so this is a really fun chapter that gives you an idea. And then another uh, big shift in cosplay was how the cosplay guest became, you know, what it is today. And this chapter was really hard to write because uh, cosplayers are fans. So, and we were for many years considered only fans not part of the industry. So when cosplayers were um, all of a sudden like elevated as guests, it created a lot of strife within the community. Like cosplayers would be like, well, why does this person get to be a guest? Pointing at me. Um, and like, what makes her so special? Or like, why is she selling prints of herself? Like, um, or uh, like conventions didn't know how to value cosplayers because we were just fans, so why pay us? You know, why like give us hotel rooms or why like um, even give us a badge? So like for many years, I had to do conventions for literally nothing. Like I would pay to go to the con, I would pay for my own room, I would pay for the badge, and then I had the honor of doing a panel for the convention or judging for the the contest for the convention. So I go through sort of that journey of how cons started to slowly, you know, incorporate cosplayers in their guest lineup. And so then chapter nine, another really huge, huge evolution in cosplay is of course the photography aspect of it. And so this chapter looks back at what it used to be like before digital cameras, uh, when we just had like disposable cameras, before smartphones, um, and then how much like uh, DSLR cameras and smartphones really changed um, how we were able to cosplay. Like it's just the, the added of like a whole new world open to us when we could take photos of our characters instead of just like showing up at a convention in a hall. All of a sudden we were able to like plan photo shoots and cosplay even outside of conventions and turn it into a year round lifestyle. So this is a really fun chapter. And then uh, this is the last chapter in the creative expression part, um, all about going beyond recreations. And so that's another thing that I have watched um, uh, really explode in cosplay. Like it used to be that you had to be 
as accurate as possible. And if you, were, you deviated from accuracy at all, you were considered a bad cosplayer. And that also included people who didn't look like the characters. So like if you were the wrong ethnicity or had the wrong skin tone, you know, it was just like a given, like you shouldn't cosplay this character. But I sort of go through like how amazing it is that we have moved beyond that and now cosplay really is about injecting your own creativity and making a character a part of you and um, altering the designs so that, you know, like doing the Jijinta or doing um, gender bend versions. You know, here we have like two Yuri cosplayers. One is doing a male version and one's doing a female version. Or like what it's like for people to cosplay memes and you know um, you know like like the the various like viral sensations that that pop up in cosplay. So it's um, really just exciting. It's just so great that at least now it's not all about accuracy anymore. So I talk about that. So my advice chapter uh, here is very hands-on advice for how to um, prep like your costumes and how to sort of like, you know, make your convention experience as nice as possible, as well as how to contact photographers, how to work with photographers and what, sh what you should expect and such. So then um, this part four, I call the duality of cosplay is hands down the toughest part in the book that I spent months going back and forth. And I, in fact, hired a uh, sensitivity reader as well um, to make sure that I would be able to approach all the subjects in it um, properly and delicately. So uh, this part is all about the not so fun aspects of cosplay because nothing is ever only sunshine and rainbows. You know, with all the amazing things that we get in cosplay, we also get a lot of negativity. So this chapter is about the negativity that I've experienced, as well as like talking about why negativity happens. You know, just like helping cosplayers understand how, uh, like, why is it that that trolls, you know, say these hurtful things, or you know, why is it that people forget that we're human beings and they only like judge us by the characters that we cosplay as, you know, or how we look in our costumes. So I, um, I sort of like went into all that a little bit. <laughs> so then uh, this chapter is a huge problem that we are still overcoming. Um, it's called the cosplay body issue. And it um, definitely talks about like, the sexualization of female cosplayers, um, as well as how like, if you you are you know very fit in your costume you're objectified but if you are not you know uh, the the desired or the appropriate shape of a character then you um, are shamed so like you know fat shaming body shaming slut shaming those types of um, things and like those are pictures of me cosplaying at San Diego Comic Con in like the late two thousands and like. That was literally back before we had cosplay is not consent, and you can just see like, and yeah, I was just like surrounded by mostly men taking photos of me from every angle, and I didn't know better, no one knew better, and it wasn't until like we slowly were um, able to speak out and start to you know create this cosplay is not consent movement that nowadays we can have a little bit more of a safer and you know. Um, enjoyable con environment. So, and then this chapter is called Racism and Blackface in Cosplay, and I really just did not want to shy away from this issue. I wanted to m make an emphasis of keeping it in the book. I'm really glad that um, my publisher and editors all agreed, and they were all very supportive, and because I think this is the one, you know, issue in cosplay that we all don't want to talk about. You know, like this is this is the one. If there is ever one that just comes up again and again and is just like the stain upon the, the face of cosplay, it is this. So this chapter goes into um, the history of 
racism, blackface, you know, these are all cosplayers that I know that are friends of mine that have experienced these things. And um, I really hope that this gives a good understanding and approaches the subject, you know, delicately as well as honestly. And it's not just about like black cosplayers suffering in cosplay, but also like POC cosplayers, even like, you know, Asian cosplayers being like, your this character is not supposed to be Asian, or like I talk about the time I cosplay Snow White and somebody made a comment, but you're not Snow White, you're Snow Yellow or something. So uh, yeah, lots and lots of stuff like that. But we need to talk about these things, you know, we need to understand these things, understand why why it's not okay and um, how to move forward and make this community more inclusive. So then my advice chapter is transforming negativity into positivity so that you can take all of these maybe not so nice aspects, but then you can find ways to um, inject your own positivity into it. You can support the cosplayers that you know are being um, marginalized and uh, you can like be more inclusive and support charitable causes and such to make our community better. Uh, so then part five, this is the last part of the book, and it's called The Industry of Cosplay. And um, I saved it for last because it is, this is like the future of cosplay. It is also, you know, the, the story of like how, how I became who I am. So like at the beginning of the book, I give you like my early life and who I was as a fan, and now this chapter, Becoming Yaya Han, is about how I, you know, like journeyed through <laughs> these last 20 years and made a name, not only made a name for myself, but like, you know, the, the different things that I tried to um, just stay in cosplay. So like, I did commissions, um, and then I did, you know, I made like angel wings for nightclubs and uh, I made, you know, like, of course, like, made my cat ears and started vending at conventions, but I also used to be a fan artist and used to sell my artwork in Artist Alley and art shows and such. So, um, and I really think the only reason that I am known in cosplay is because I've done everything I could just to stay in this world. Like, Whatever I can do to go to conventions and to work at conventions or make, a, make money doing something at conventions, I just wanted to go and I wanted more chances to cosplay. And so really like the cat years um, have really helped me be, uh, be able to build a name for myself from a grassroots side because I just kept showing up like for years and years I just kept showing up with my table of cat ears and I would sell cat ears and I would cosplay and so over time more and more people got to know me so um, it was a very long process and then I also talk about how I uh, was food licked like I uh, there was a vendor that food licked my cat ears and then tried to put my little handmade cat ear business out of business, so then I had to sue that vendor, and I had to like put cease and desist letters at like Anime Expo and Otakon, like the biggest conventions um, uh, in the country, and just like that whole scary process of having to go through copyright litigation. So um, then the folds over into like the next part of my, you know, career, which is, you know, being on Heroes of Cosplay and then, you know, designing um, patterns from McCall's and getting into fabric uh, creation with Joann's. And so I talk about Heroes of Cosplay on this one. So like lots of people that want to know what it was like to be on the show, I give you this chapter. And so it, it's an insight. Um, but I also talk about like, what made Heroes of Cosplay actually uh, positive for the community, like how we helped the community and how it also opened doors for me and led to more opportunities. So then chapter 16 is called Cosplay as a Career. So it is um, my way of sort of 
chronicling the different ways that people can make a living with cosplay currently. And it's just very exciting because I got to ask my friends to, you know, um, supply photos for illustrations. We have Vulpin Props over here and their entire team building, um, you know, really like amazing things for video game companies and this is for Arby's. And then Meg Turney uh, is really like creating her own brand uh, around her, like, around her like, uh, how do you say, personality and um, fan base. So lots and lots of different ways, you know, me going into product design, um, Bill Durant from Punish Props doing educational information, like there's so many ways to make cosplay a career now. So this sort of gives you the overviews. I also put advantages and disadvantages of each career. <laughs> Just to be like, set your expectations, <laughs> you know, too realistic. And then my advice chapter is, um, of course, connected to how to go pro. So hands-on advice and tips for what you should do if you decide you want to take cosplay to the next level. Um, things like, co you know, copywriting your your uh, logo. You know, create, you know, getting a website, and you know, um, uh, how to manage uh, the creative aspect, but also the administrative aspect. Like you have to know like maybe only 25% of my time is gonna be doing creative stuff. The rest of the time is gonna be answering emails and doing taxes and stuff. So like I give some advice in that area. Uh, and then I close out my book with The Dream of Cosplay, uh, which is all the things that cosplay has given me, why it has been worth it to go on this journey, and as well as how much it brought my family closer. Because, of course, I was born in China, so my dad is in China. But then I grew up in Germany, so my mom and my stepdad are in Germany. So they, of course, did not understand cosplay and for the longest time thought I was crazy and you know, was going to go like totally destitute. And, but because I've been successful in my dream, they have become supportive and here they're like at conventions and they're helping me. My mom will like iron my costumes for me and she'll like insist on brushing my wigs for me. And it's just like we got closer as a family. So, uh, and that's how I wanted to close out my book. <laughs> what to expect in the book, so I hope you all really, really, really want to read it now. But um, I also wanted to talk about the writing process uh, because I think that was a huge, huge lesson for me and really, um, really eye-opening. And um, I thought, like, I just wanted to share what that was like. So the publisher contacted me in 2017 and they asked me to submit an outline and a treatment, like a writing treatment. I was like, Googling. Writing treatment, <laughs> you know? But what it means is like, they just want you to write a sample, just like a sample mini chapter. They want like 500 words on like, what to expect my writing style to be. And I'm like, I've never written a book in my life. I've never written, you know, anything but beyond blog posts and, you know, like <laughs> whatever, how, how to use on my website. Um, but I gave it my shot. I sort of painted a scene of what New York Comic Con was like. And so that is actually in the intro of the book. That's how the book opens. So I wrote that. I sort of like painted what the excitement was like to be at New York Comic Con in a costume, you know, feeling confident, feeling like a superhero. Like I'm not the short purple haired Asian girl that I am um, every day. I am, you know, Scarlet Witch. Uh, so then they gave me a book offer based on my submission. And then they just left me alone for like two years to write. And of course I was supposed to write it in a year and uh, totally could not get my um, head around the book uh, because back then it was gonna be more of a crafting book anyway. And so I actually took most of 2018 to travel, to talk to people, to really like immerse myself in the convention and cosplay scene with the intention of gathering research and to prepare myself to write the book. 
that really, really helped because like it, it like reinforced a lot of like things that I just like thought about on my own. But then I was able to have conversations with people and where I'm like, yeah, this is a problem. You know, this we should talk about this in the book, or this is something that was really exciting when it finally changed. And so then I spent um, 2019 writing. So I, I didn't do very many conventions in 2019, and I wrote probably from January through June. Every day I would like go into my room, and like writing is a tough process. I don't know, are there any writers in this room? I don't, does it come easy to you, or is it like teeth pulling at times? It depends on like the day of the week. It's <laughs> very nebulous. Yeah, yeah, so, so that was very interesting, like to, to figure out my writing process. Like I've tried, I try to different things. Like some people like, you should, you should like have a glass of wine and then write. I was like, I try, I cannot write a single sentence because I just get sleepy and I just like want to watch anime. Like I tried to, I was like, nope. Can't do that, so cannot do the whole. Uh, so then, um, I I guess like what worked for me was actually writing during the day, and um, to put on like music that didn't have any words. I was like, I tried music with words, can't write. <laughs> what that's going? On? No, it has to be music without words. So that's been very fun and interesting to figure out and sort of like um, challenge myself because I feel like you know every costume is a challenge, but Writing a book is just the worst. It's like the, the hardest thing I've ever done, probably. Uh, so once, um, like, so what, what actually, yes, I wanted to talk about the editing and layout process. So the editor that the publisher gave me, I thought that, that I'd be able to just like send in chapters or drafts and they would like read it and give me feedback. No, no, they were not doing that. They were just, just, managing me on top of like a whole other slew of writers and they were just more there to to be like hey hey are you gonna submit more hey and so i ended up hiring my own content editor so i hired a writer friend of mine uh who was available to me every week that i could literally just go to and be like colette does this sound stupid you know, and I was just like, like, I really want to talk about this thing, but is anybody going to be interested in reading this? And she'd be like, yes, yes, go into more detail on that. Or she would like just reinforce and give me confidence to continue on. And then she would ask questions, be like, well, what about this, this part? And um, I would like, okay, okay, I'll flesh this out or I'll like explain this better. So it was really, really helpful. Thank you, Yaya Han, for that, uh, for the presentation on your book. We do appreciate having you here every year at Holiday Matsuri. Thank you so much. I love Holiday Matsuri. I look forward to coming here every year. It's my the best way to close out the year for me, and I hope I get to see everyone next year as well. If you liked what you heard today in the presentation, uh, thank you for watching us here on YouTube. Please like, subscribe, and come to Holiday Matsuri. Yes, go to Holiday Matsuri. Mm -hmm.